This isn't the story of how dogs evolved, not the story of how dogs came to be, as so many of these tales are. Rather, this is really the story about why dogs and humans have become the best of friends. All my life I've been around dogs, and I think it can be fairly said that I have a natural affinity for them. My earliest childhood memories are literally filled with dogs, sitting by the back screen door of our humble country home on rainy days with my hand pressed to the screen to try to pet the dog because my mother didn't like to let dogs in the house. Or that day I first threw a stick and discovered my dog would happily bring it back. And that childhood heartbreak when one day the dog wandered into the woods, never to return. In my life, there has always been a dog at my side. I can't really imagine life without them. They live in my home and share my meals. They wander the backwoods with me. They are constant companions, always faithful, always kind, always devoted and loving and sensitive to whatever mood is on my mind. And some of them, like my border collie here, Gilly Doo, possess an almost preternatural ability to understand what I'm saying. Among all the species in the world, I don't think any have ever developed a bond so based on love and trust and mutual friendship as humans and dogs. Certainly there are symbiotic species, those organisms that share a relationship because it helps them to survive in the natural world. But that shared between humans and dogs is something unique and special between our species. A love for one another that transcends mere practical benefit. And these just aren't my sentiments. These are sentiments about dogs that many, literally millions, perhaps billions of people share. One of the reasons I spent a decade of my life obtaining degrees in the field of psychology was my desire to understand the mind of nature, the mind of the natural world, and perhaps especially the minds of dogs. So just what is it about dogs that makes them fit us so well? What is it about our psychology that allows us to relate so well to dogs? One might honestly say dogs and humans are far too different to suit each other well. Consider this. We each understand the world on a sensory, perceptive level in extremely different ways. Humans are very, very much vision focused. Whereas dogs, on the other hand, have one of the most sensitive noses among any creatures in the natural world. Did you know that a dog can smell the presence of a single teaspoon of sugar dissolved into an entire Olympic-sized swimming pool? Which means there is one mere molecule of sugar among many millions of molecules of water and chlorine and other substances present in the water, and yet the dog can detect if that sugar is there. Humans could never pull this off, not by a long shot. But on the other hand, we have one of the best abilities in nature to understand visual gestalts. That is to say, humans are very, very good at picking out patterns and objects in complex visual fields. It's why animal camouflage that seems to work so well with other animals doesn't do so well in fooling humans. And it is why, when I'm playing fetch with Gilly Doo, that if I throw him a stick and it lands among a few other sticks in the woods, he can't tell the one that I threw from the others lying about and will just pick up one randomly. For me, with my brain's natural ability to process visual imagery, I know effortlessly which stick is which. To look at another sense that we share, hearing. It is true that dogs can hear a much higher pitch than humans, but it takes a human to note if a single flute is out of tune within an orchestra. And as well, it takes a human to discern the complex blend of rhythms, melodies, and counter melodies, and layers upon layers of sound that turn the cacophony that is an orchestra into beautiful music. We and dogs see, hear, and overall sense the world in substantially different ways. But something, something almost inscrutable, makes us natural friends. For many years I dwelt at a remote cabin in the far north. Not this cabin, this was my second, larger and more civilized cabin. The neighbors were over the horizon, and the closest village consisted of all of 400 people, 50 miles away as the crow flies. I loved it, and when I was there... I had the pleasure of making the acquaintance of a wolf. I was too poor to afford a good camera in those days, but he looked a lot like this wolf. This wolf, who I came to call Max, had been adopted as a puppy, but the person who had adopted him could not manage the rigors of far northern life, and soon left for the warmer, gentler regions further south. When I came upon the wolf, he was half-tamed. He wanted to be around people, but he was cautious. I was profoundly concerned about him because in the far north, a half-tamed wolf is a dead wolf. 
Many people still hold an old fear of wolves. I would really think of it more as a prejudice. It's completely unfounded. But sadly, many northern folk would shoot wolves if given the opportunity, and a half-tame wolf is going to seek the company of people. So I took him in. I adopted him. And at first, it was an uneasy alliance. The wolf, who I came to call Max for Maximilian, occasionally tried to compete with me in ways that you would not see a domestic dog do. He would growl over food as if he was going to stake claim to it before I did. When we were going out into the bush to hunt up some dinner, usually a snowshoe hare, he would follow me along, but loosely, mostly keeping it in mind to do his own thing. He maintained his independence, and he was remarkably intelligent. It did not take him too long to figure out that turning the knob on the cabin door would open the door, so when he was inside and he wanted out, it wasn't long till he started trying to turn that knob for himself. It also wasn't too long before he came to understand that the shotgun that I carried when we were out hunting for snowshoe hares killed things, and when he saw me lower the shotgun, he would get behind me. In fact, it wasn't until we had a run-in with a grizzly bear that nearly killed him that Max came to see me as at least his equal. He was outside and cornered at the side of the cabin by the grizzly, and I heard him howl piteously, grabbed the shotgun and jumped out the door, and fired off a couple shots over the grizzly bear's head. The grizzly bear startled, immediately took off running, and it was 4 a.m. and I was dead tired not thinking. I took off chasing after the grizzly bear. And it wasn't until that chase ended up with me trudging through an ice-cold lake that I woke up enough to think, what the hell am I doing? I am chasing a grizzly bear. Anyway, I went back to the cabin, and I guess Max decided, hey, if you're ornery enough to go chasing after a grizzly bear, then I guess you can be in charge. Things went smoothly in our relationship after that. There was no more growling over food, and he generally stayed much closer to me on our hikes and hunts so that I didn't have to worry about what he was up to and if he was getting into trouble. But looking back on my relationship with Max, all these years later, it was so close. We lived together and relied upon each other. And yet, we were from two entirely different species. Max was a wolf. He was born in the wilds. His ancestors had been wild. How is it that a creature so different from me came to understand me? And how is it that I could equally as well read and understand him? His body language, his signs that he was afraid or wanted attention or was hungry or thirsty. The experience with Max the Wolf all those years ago made it very real in my mind that there is something deep and profound between the psychologies of humans and dogs that leads us naturally to be friends. It is no wonder our ancestors, 40,000 years ago at the very least, felt a kinship with wolves and over time took them in, or perhaps it was the wolves who took them in, leading us ultimately to becoming each other's best friends. Mark Durr, in his intriguing book, How the Dog Became the Dog, notes that somehow wolves and humans all those millennia ago must have sensed this commonness of spirit and this drew us to each other. Evolutionary biologists speculate that from that point forward, those wolves would show generally more amenable social behavior, as well as desirable traits such as being protective of the people that they lived with or good at being hunting dogs, got to spend more time in the company of people, got fed better, experienced greater survivability, and thus the genes that favored sociability with humans were amplified. This breeding of wolves for sociability with humans is relatively recent in the grand scheme of things. It began to happen perhaps 40,000 years ago, though possibly as recently as 27,000. It is then speculated that those wolves who later became dogs became so closely bonded into human communities that they became loved as much as humans. There is prehistoric evidence of dogs receiving human-like burials. And there is a tragically sad myth out of ancient Kimru, which is modern Wales, of a dog that protected a prince's baby from a wolf attack. But when the prince entered the baby's room, he saw only blood everywhere. The baby was out of sight under some broken furniture. And the prince did not realize that the blood belonged to the attacking wolf. Thinking the dog had killed his child, the enraged prince killed the faithful dog and then discovered the sleeping baby under the furniture. Racked by regret for having betrayed his faithful companion, the prince raised a cairn to remember and honor the deceased dog. These theories that wolves eventually develop the social traits to become dogs, creatures capable of integrating themselves to our lives to the point they became family members, they make good sense. But having experienced life in a wild place with a wolf, I would note that we already find all the psychological characteristics and behavioral characteristics in a wolf that humans ultimately value in dogs. He was loving. He was sociable. He was good at reading me. And the same applied from me to him. I could read his body language quite well, intuitively. 
I'm just saying I think wolves and humans were fully capable of becoming friends long before the current anthropological record. The bond between humans and our canine companions is also attributed to a chemical called oxytocin naturally present in the brain. There are other natural chemicals involved in feelings of friendship and positivity besides oxytocin, such as serotonin and endorphins. But we're not going to overly complicate this. In an excellent article called The Neuroethology of Friendship by Brent, Chang, Gariepi, and Platt, the authors discuss the concept that friendship is not something found only among humans. Animals also make friends. Their paper focuses on the friendships of primates, but they note that the principles apply across species, at least across mammalian species. Friendships are mutually beneficial, so much so that we have evolved neurobiology to promote the development of friendships. And hormones such as oxytocin, among other natural chemicals, provide us impetus to develop those friendships and give us reward feelings for doing so. But in another study by Kakusi, dog owners and wolf owners were invited to join. The study was simple in principle. It would measure for oxytocin rise following the interactions, in particular eye gazing between dogs, wolves, and their humans. Now eye gazing is common with dogs. They know to interact with humans this way. However, it's not so common with wolves. Wolves interpret eye gazing as an aggressive behavior. And Kakusi found that when dogs and humans look at each other, their oxytocin rises. In male and female dogs, oxytocin levels rose by 130%. In the humans, however, oxytocin levels rose by 300%. This means that both humans and dogs find their interaction deeply rewarding. But does it mean that humans find the reward of interaction with dogs much more rewarding than dogs find the reward of interacting with us? Probably not. I suspect that humans simply need more oxytocin to trigger a similar response since we also think as a way of modulating our emotional responses. But that's a topic for another time. But what Kukusi found is that when dogs and humans interact, in this case by simply looking into each other's eyes, oxytocin levels rose, profoundly rewarding the sense of bonding between our two species. This says a couple things. One, dogs have evolved to need and desire a relationship with us. And it says the same thing about us. Dogs have affected our evolution as well. We have evolved with a powerful need to be with our canine companions. And yet I go back to the question, how is it that I had bonded with this wolf so well? I found the wolf to be a very social animal and deeply rewarding to be around. Occasionally challenging because of his wolfiness, though that was simply a product of being a wild animal, but nonetheless deeply rewarding to be around. What we have in common psychologically cannot easily be reduced into simply explainable terms. However, we both share very high intelligence. The intelligence of wolves is very similar to that of humans. Now they think about the world quite differently, but wolves have a very human ability to reason through problems, show compassion, such as by taking care of their sick and elderly, and like us, they mourn their dead, they grieve. Like us, they are social creatures and tribal by nature, forming strong family and clan bonds. In these regards, wolves are very much like us. Wolves and their dog subspecies and humans also share another trait, hypersociability. Now, hypersociability can be interpreted as a defect and a problem. In a paper called The Other Side of the Coin, Hypersociability by Miklos Toth, Toth describes hypersociability as, and I quote, a developmental abnormality leading to failure in discrimination between familiar and stranger in the amygdala and or increased reward or reduced aversion in the VTA-NAC pathway. So hypersociability can be a problem. It can lead to a person or an animal getting into trouble by way of poor social discrimination or difficulty spotting where trouble lies. However, there's another way of looking at hypersociability in that it is the ability to form friendships where friendships would not normally form, such as outside of one species. We can see the characteristic of hypersociability every time a dog licks the house cat or when the pet cockatiel snuggles up with the dog for a nap. Or, for those of us who live on farms and homesteads in the backwoods, when the dog wants to cuddle up with the baby goats come spring. It is the presence of this ability to form bonds across species in combination with our similar psychologies that emphasize friendships and family and clan bonds, and our social natures that incline us to constantly be at work reading mutually relatable cues and in social interaction that have ultimately led to the mental characteristics that cause humans and dogs to bond so perfectly. So perfectly, in fact, that many people would consider dogs much more reliable and consistent friends than their fellow humans. I think it is one of the great marvels of nature that dogs and humans have become the companions and friends that they have. 
It's something, insofar as we know, unique in evolutionary history. Certainly many species have formed symbiotic relationships, but the relationship between dogs, their cousins wolves, and humans is driven by a mutual love, friendship, and even mutual respect. It is about more than just mutual survival. This means that two species from entirely different genera co-evolved ways of socially interacting and traits of hypersociability and high intelligence which is not all that common in the natural world and did so at roughly the same time so that our species were able to meet and connect. The story of our amazingly matched psychologies, that of dogs and wolves and humans, is an incredible tale. And I think an equally incredible tale, though yet to be explored, is what was it about the world 40,000 years ago when Earth was a much wilder and more varied place that created the circumstances that would cause two so very different species to evolve a bond more emotionally and psychologically compelling than any other species has shared insofar as we know since the dawn of life on Earth. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like. Hot leaves are turning brown, branches burn.